was before the Lord and I got excited at the thought of being here this Sunday because I want to give to you a prophetic word. I want you to know that God is not through with fellowship. And I want to talk about I want to talk about water because water is an analogy that God uses. He talks about rivers and water constantly through the word. It is used as an analogy of the very life of God. Amen. Amen. And so I believe that there's a new wind, somebody say new wind, new wind, of revival that is happening in the church. And not in the sense of how we have known revival in the past, but I want you to know something. Before we can crusade for the cause of Christ to those that are lost, those that are in Christ, need to be revived and you cannot you cannot be revived to something that you never had so revival is not for those that are unsaved but rather God wants to do something in the body of Christ a new wind if you will amen in the body of Christ and so I want to talk about uh, the concept I preach this word uh, before and the Lord brought it back to me a couple of days ago. I want to talk about the idea of measure, say with me, measure, measure. And, flow. and flow. One more time, measure, measure. And, flow. and flow. In the beginning of creation, when God put man in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says that there was a river that went out to it. Amen. And if you will, We'll notice that the word river is used quite frequently in the Bible. The Bible in the book of Psalms, and this is not my text, Shirley, and I know you're ready for me. Get for me Ezekiel 47 and just hold it for me, Ezekiel 47. Um, but in Psalms, the Bible says that God's people, listen to this, God's people shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house yes, amen. amen amen and thou shalt make them to drink of the river of thy pleasures amen and then Ezekiel picks up with this theme of water and he explores it via a vision that God gave him. If you remember in the book of Ezekiel, it is a series of visions. Amen. And Ezekiel saw a man or a form of a man who had several facets to his face. We believe the man was God himself. 
paid a visit to Ezekiel and talked about the temple of God. Now hear me now, hear me now. This is what God said would happen with the temple of God. Uh, Ezekiel 48, and surely we need, we must read verses 1 through 12. It's a little lengthy, but I want you to hear this word. Amen. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house, uh -huh. and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east side, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house oh. at the south side of the altar. Read. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the other gate by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. Read. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. All right. The, Read. I'm, I'm, I'm the waters that. were to the ankle. Mm -hmm. Again he measured a thousand uh -huh. and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Read. Again he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters were to the lions. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the water. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river, were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Mm -hmm. Then he said unto me, these waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. Three. And it came to pass that every thing that liveth, which moveth, whatsoever the rivers shall come, shall live, and there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and every thing shall live, whether the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi even unto Engilan. They shall be a place to spread forth nests. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. Drop to 12 first. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months. Mm -hmm. Because their waters, they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. All right, in essence, I know the vision is a little difficult, but in essence, Ezekiel frequently referred to water, especially in this particular chapter, as a vivid river flowing out from under the temple. Are you with me? Don't go to sleep on me. Don't leave me yet. Amen. Now, John, in his book of life, said, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto ever lasting life amen amen again this is john if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink he that believeth on me as the scripture hath said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living 
water. And the last chapter of the Bible, it is said that in the New Jerusalem, there is a pure river of water of life. It is proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb of God. So in all of these passages where you see water mentioned, it really is, uh, 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 an, it is uh, the, a symbol of the life of God. On, Let me tell you something that we quote, and I think we missed the point. We quote John 10, 10, which simply says, the thief cometh but to, for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God said, or Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it in abundance. And most of the time, when we think in terms of the life that, that Jesus is talking about, we think in, in terms of things external things and blessings of God. The word life in John 10, 10 is the word in the Greek is the word zoe. And God is saying, the thief has come to steal from you, but I have come to give you not just anything. I have come to give you my life, to put my life, not things, but my very life into you. And so John says, as the scripture has said, those that believe on him, out of our belly would flow rivers of life, living water, the very life of God. And so the question that comes to mind is, how do we consider this life that is to come into us, how do, does it then flow out of us? How does the life of God that enters in, how does it flow out like rivers of living water? Ezekiel says that the water issued out from the temple. John said it flows out of our belly. Amen. If you link what Ezekiel is saying and what John is saying, you will see that the way that the life of God begins to flow and revival begins to happen in, in the church is that God does something Ezekiel calls measuring. God begins to measure. Now hang with me for just a second. Ezekiel says that you will see that when God begins to measure water begins to flow. Ezekiel said, the man of God or the angel of God or God himself in this vision measured and after he measured, water came up to the ankles. But he didn't just measure one time, he measured again and water came up to the knees. And he measured a third time and water came up to the loins. And by the fourth time that he measured, uh, Ezekiel said, the water became so deep that it was water that only you could swim in. Now I'm going somewhere, somebody. If you pray with me for just a few minutes. Amen. Uh, uh, what is meant by the idea or the concept of measuring. I want you to look at one other portion of scripture and I promise you, I'm not gonna be much longer. I'm gonna make my point and I'm gonna sit down, amen, amen. But what is meant by the idea or the concept of measuring? If you look back a few chapters into the 42nd chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel explains what measuring is. 40, 42nd chapter and the 20th verse. He Ezekiel, measured. He measured. He measured it by the four sides. He measured it by, or he measured the temple by the four sides. Read. It had a wall round about. It had a wall. Listen now closely, because I don't want you to miss this point. The temple had a wall round about it. 500 reeds long. 500 reeds long. And 500 broad. Reed. 
to make a separation between... Oh, here we go. Here's the reason for the measuring. To make a separation between the sanctuary between the sanctuary and the profane and the profane. Help me, Holy Ghost. Amen. So God measured. Amen. Amen. And He put a fence around that that He had measured, and said, "What He has measured." has now become holy. What he has measured is no longer common. Amen. He makes a separation when he measures between the sanctuary and the profane. Uh, there is a sacredness to whatever God measures off, whatever God measures off becomes what we call consecrated to God. I'm going somewhere, saints. God wants his people to be consecrated, and if he wants them to be consecrated, then God must need measure you. Oh, you're not with me. Yeah. And when God measures, whichever part of you that God measures is no longer common, but it becomes sacred. What is naturally worldly, amen, after it has been measured, becomes godly. Amen. So now, in Ezekiel's communion with God, Ezekiel saw the measurer in a vision. And the measurer, not in this chapter, but earlier, around the 40th chapter, the measurer has the appearance of brass. Amen. And whenever the Bible talks about or relates to a visitation from God, usually it will talk about God's appearance. Amen. For instance, in Revelations, the fourth chapter, John saw God sitting on his throne and he said he looked like a jasper. Amen. Ezekiel saw God and he looked like brass. And the significance of brass in the Bible is always judgment. Amen. The altar, you remember the brazing altar in the temple of God was made out of brass. It represented judgment. Amen. The brazen serpent in the wilderness, amen, was brass. Amen. It was significant of Jesus being judged and convicted of sin on our behalf. Brass represents judgment. Amen. Amen. That the, the measure has appeared... Uh, as brass means that he is appearing to us to judge us. Why must he judge us? Because we sometimes cannot differentiate between what is evil and what is good. Things are not so black white anymore. And for us to judge ourselves we would have to understand God's criteria or his measuring uh, 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 mechanism. We don't understand how God judges. And so what we have to do is we have to leave the judgment up to God. And what God does is one day when we're in prayer and we're communicating with God, we touch God, God touches us, and something happens. All of a sudden, God begins to speak. You, see, you know, folks always want to, you know, God to appear. We want to talk to God. We want to see his presence. We talk about that when we're in praise. Oh, just to behold your face. Let me tell you something. Whenever the perfection of God steps into a room, it's not going to make you shout. Oh, come on, somebody. 
because God is so absolutely perfect he's going to show you up for your imperfection so when God shows up in our, in our dedication and our consecration to God something happens all of a sudden God shows up and as opposed to praise God says your mouth is dirty oh you all are getting quiet on me I'm going somewhere your mouth is filthy and your tongue is too sharp you need to watch what you say that's when God begins to illuminate and measure the mouth God is saying this mouth no longer belongs to you your tongue won't no longer be so sharp and your mouth won't be so filthy from now on from now on your mouth is no longer profane your mouth is no longer common but what comes out of this mouth now has been consecrated to God and when you talk and when you get ready to do your junk it won't be so easy it reminds me of Isaiah in the sixth chapter of Isaiah when Isaiah said in the year that King Isaiah died I saw the Lord how'd you see him Isaiah well I saw him high and lifted up and his train filled the temple hallelujah amen meaning that God was geographically everywhere at the same time God wasn't frustrated he wasn't pacing back and forth in heaven trying to figure out what he was going to do with us he was sitting down because you know his work is finished I don't know whether you know it or not his work is finished amen and God's going to accomplish what he's going to accomplish so Isaiah said I saw him high and lifted up and I saw these great big angelic beings and if you will they was kind of arranged in choir stands there was the seraphims over here on this side and the cherubims over here on this side and the throne of God was in the center and those angels even though they had been with God forever and ever every time they looked at him they saw a new facet of him God was so awesome to them that they didn't know what to do so one of them stood up in the choir stand and said holy and one of the choir members over on this side said I know what you're talking about they looked at him and said holy that's all I can say those big gigantic angels they're so powerful that the Bible says that the doorpost shook when they spoke but when they looked at God God was awesome and Isaiah is, is, is looking at this vision and all of a sudden this prophet this man of God began to speak and you know what he said he said whoa is me say what's wrong with you Isaiah you're a man of God you're a prophet you've been preaching you're solid you're seasoned what's wrong Isaiah what are you talking about what is he said I'm a man of unclean lips I dwell among people with unclean lips and somebody said Isaiah how do you know that I'll tell you how I know that I'm unclean he said because my eyes have seen the king of kings what I'm trying to tell you says is when you have a visitation from God you won't look so wonderful all that perfection you've been boasting of when his perfection comes in the room you see yourself now folks have been trying to tell you about yourself for a long time they've been telling you about your mouth and your and your stuff but you didn't hear them but one visitation from God and God begins to measure off and say listen honey this mouth of yours has got to change uh, somebody said what kind of anniversary message is this this is to take you on from one level of holiness to a new level there's some things that God wants to do with his people one of the things that he wants to do is he wants to measure us so that the life of God can flow out from us folks have talked until they blew in the face folks have told you get your mouth off Pastor Jenkins get your eyes on
God knows better than you what he's doing. He don't need your big mouth up in the middle of it doing divisive stuff. What he wants to do is consecrate your mouth so that what comes out of it is holy. Uh, what right have you to come in here and tell? Listen, listen. By the authority of God, I'm preaching what I'm preaching this afternoon. You don't know how to help? Shut your mouth. The best way you can help is get in your prayer closet. And tell God, tell God whatever's wrong with this picture, you fix it, God. You don't need my two cents. When God begins to show up, what folks have been trying to tell you about yourself for years, you'll have to agree with God. Hallelujah. What do I agree? If God says my mouth is dirty, if he says my tongue is too sharp, I agree with you, God. Hallelujah. Set me free from myself because it ain't the other folks at fellowship that's in my way. I'm in my... Where God shows up in judgment, there will be measurement. God will measure. Hallelujah. I'm almost finished. Hallelujah. And to whatever degree the life of God flows out of you, it is commensurate with how much you have yielded to the judgment of God. See, there are a lot of preachers that know a lot of scripture with wonderful vo vocabularies. Amen. But there's no life in their preaching because God has not measured off their mouth yet. You don't bear unholy fruit or holy fruit from an unholy vessel. Amen. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Amen. Let me finish this up. God starts, this is the good news, saints. God starts from the inside out. Let me tell you something. Can I serve notice on you? This I don't feel like rushing. Amen. I, I, I want to make this point. The church for too long has turned out hypocrites because we make folks act holy until they get holy. They get so accustomed to acting that they don't know what the real... They don't know what the real deal is. The Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. God starts from the inside. Listen, change has got to take place from the inside before it is before it's demonstrated, before it's before you set an example on the out. It's got to happen inside. Let me tell you something. You can only keep up a farce, something that is not real, only for so long. And then pretty soon, something's going to push the wrong button and the real you is going to come out. What God wants to do is he wants to illumine you, give you revelation as to who you are. God wants to show you about your love. You've accepted and embraced his love, but you've not loved him back. You've loved, you've loved with some prejudice. And I tell you how I know, because the same thing happens in Oakland, California. If Pastor Evans ain't preaching, we don't want to come to church. As if Pastor Evans is the only vessel. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm talking right in front of his face because he knows it's the truth. Your salvation is not wrapped up in how well Pastor Evans preaches. Your salvation is wrapped up in how much of the Word of God you personally adhere to. It ain't, you ain't doing nothing because you can go back and quote the message. 
but how much of the message are you living? God will deal with your love. Show you how, how you love, hallelujah. How you, how you attack people. How you, how you patient with one person and can't stand. Don't tell me when you get on your knees, God won't tell you. He'll tell you. Is anybody with me? Can we shout now? One day God begins to deal with you. You go before him because your heart is inclined toward God. Any believer's heart is inclined before God. But, but see, the thing is, we don't really know what's in us until God begins to show us. So we go bef before him and God begins to deal with our thoughts. And says your thoughts are unbridled. Your thoughts are going everywhere. You shout in one minute and you're looking at somebody's behind the next minute. said it. God says, I want to measure off your thoughts. And then God gets down to your will. Amen. You see, we don't really have a problem with God's will. God's will is okay. What's God's will? I would that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. We like that. We like that. What we have a problem with is not his will. We have a problem with God's way. His will ain't no problem because his will is that he wants, you know, he wants all of us to prosper and do well. But how does he accomplish his will? With the children of Israel, he took them into the wilderness. He said, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. Oh, that's wonderful. You're going to bring us out of bondage and you're going to set us free? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Well, fine, God, we like your will. But God says the way to Canaan is through the wilderness. That's God's way. And what did they say? They got out there after they got through shouting, after they went through the Red Sea, and Miriam made up some songs and they sung praises unto God. The next thing they were doing was complaining and said, what the God that we had died in Egypt? At least we had meat to eat and we knew where our next meal was coming from. It may not have been the best of worlds, but at least we knew what, what to expect. Out here, we don't know nothing. God says, I got you right where I want you. I want you in a place where you will trust me to take you from where you are to where I am. I want to, I'm almost finished, I promise. I want to, I want to validate us. I want to affirm us. I'm not talking this morning about your salvation. I'm not talking about whether you're going to heaven or to hell. I'm talking about bona fide believers whom God has to take, not from, has to take you from your natural self. I heard the pastor say it already, that the, the old man, the old man, the man of sin and death, he's dead. He was nailed to the cross. God is not going to fix him. He's not going to repair him. He's not going to dress him up. He nailed him to the cross. The old man is dead. God doesn't have a problem with the old man because he's out of the way. What he has a problem with is your flesh. We think we know better than God. We think we know better than the pastor. God says, I got to get you out of the way. I'm going to measure you and I'm going to measure you and I'm going to measure, it doesn't happen overnight. Somebody said it doesn't happen overnight. Amen. Heaven is immediate. Eternal life is immediate. As soon as you give your life to God. Amen. You're eternally saved. That's not my argument. But your flesh thinks it knows better than God. Let me tell you something. You are no better than Jesus. In the third chapter, uh, 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 is it Matthew or is it John? One of them. It's in the, in the word. God spoke out of heaven when Jesus was about to be baptized. And God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, listen to me. Listen to me closely. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, God spoke that before Jesus did any ministry. Hallelujah. 
How could God say that he was pleased with Jesus and he hadn't done anything? Because God knew that what he placed in him was more than enough for him to be more than a conqueror. God knows what he's placed in us is more than enough for us to succeed. God is not concerned as to whether or not you can make it because he's given you everything that you need for you to make it. So God spoke and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. We now, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We are created unto good works which God hath before before, before what? Before you do anything, God has already ordained it. So God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then, that's the end of the third chapter. Then in the fourth chapter, it starts with this word. T-H-E-N. Then. When. After God said, this is my son. After God affirmed him. Then God did what? led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil because you don't really know God until you've been through something. Don't tell me about him being a healer and a deliverer taking away out of no way and you ain't never been healed, you ain't never been delivered, you ain't never been in trouble. I don't want nobody preaching to me that ain't never been in trouble. Because you don't know what you're talking about. You're talking from your head. I want somebody who's had an experience. See, I can tell you all day about, I can, I can tell you all day, I can tell you about swimming. I can read any book I want and give you instructions on how to swim. I don't even have to know how to swim myself to recite the instructions. But you won't really know how to swim until you've been thrown in the water. And you won't really swim until you get in trouble. Now you may piddle around in the three feet, but you're going to get serious if you get over in the ten feet. When you come out of the water, somebody said, do you know how to swim? You say, I know what I'm talking about. How do you know? Because I've been in the pool. takes all of us through experiences to groom us. It is his measuring process. God begins to measure and God measures and he measures and he measures again. Let me tell you this, Jason, I'm through. Ezekiel said when he measured once, the water came up to his ankles. Now, let me tell you something about that. If God begins to pull in the ranks you ever been in a position where God told you to shut your mouth or sit down be quiet well you know you can ignore God if you want you don't have to listen to him it just means that ain't much water flowing yet Ezekiel said when he measured the first time the water was around my ankles now if the water is around my ankles it means that I can still move about of my own will. I'm a little bit restrained. It's not like being on dry ground. If I were on dry ground, I can run and skip and do whatever I want. But with the water around my ankles, it kind of slows me down just a little bit. I can't quite, because the water is controlling something. Ezekiel said, God measured the first time, measured off some of your stuff, amen, and slowed you down. <laughs> And just when you thought God was through, here comes another experience. You know, some people think that trouble means that God is not pleased. Let me tell you, trouble is good. I'm going to say it again, trouble is good. When you get a see, you, everybody, anybody can shout on the mountaintop. Anybody can get up on the mountain after you've had trouble, after you've been through and God has alleviated the trouble. Anybody can shout on the mountain. That ain't no big deal. 
God brought me out. God brought me through. Well, fine and dandy. That's not the deal. The deal is when you're in the valley, in the middle of a situation, and God teaches you how to shout in the valley. And what I'm trying to tell you is that God brings situations into our lives to bring the water level up. See, something is happening. The water level, it means that the life of God is beginning to flow out of me. So Ezekiel said that God measured a second time and the water came up to the knees. Well now, I can still move about. But now I'm having a little bit of trouble. See, the way I used to go, I can't quite go that way. Anyway, it, I used to could do what I did. I could get on the phone and I could talk about everybody and go to sleep. Now, something is happening. Oh, you don't hear me. The life of God is beginning to flow now. And so I can't quite freely do what I want. But now, I have those urges when I want to. And it, it takes a little bit more effort. But I'm still doing my stuff. I'm still doing my thing. You know, I'm still. And all of a sudden, God sends another situation. And God begins to measure. Now, this time, he's measuring your mind and, and your heart. You know, and Ezekiel said, the water this time came up around my waist. Now, I'm restrained. I don't need nobody, K, to watch me in order for me to live saved. Now I'm living it when I'm by myself and ain't nobody looking because this thing is between me and God now. Honey, I'm not trying to impress you anymore. I just can't quite do what I used to. You know what I'm saying? This, you know, it's still that little self-will in me, Brother Pastor, but it, it ain't what it, it used to be. It's, you know, you know, I get carried away once in a while, but it ain't like I used to do it. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. That's how he works on you. He, he works. He measures, and then the water flows. He measures, and then the water flows. He measures, and then the water flows. And then Ezekiel said he measured a fourth time. This time, he said the water was so deep, it became a river. Now when it becomes a river, let me tell you the difference now. When it becomes a river, a river as opposed to a bay has a flow. And when the river is flowing and you know it's so deep that you can't stand up in it, what it means is that you're going to have to go with the flow. Whatever God says, whatever he wants to do, choice anymore he's measuring me and that life of God is beginning to flow out when I open my mouth and speak I don't have to be deep I don't have to quote a lot of scriptures but Jesus ought to be in my smile he ought to be in my hello oh you don't hear me you don't hear me he doesn't need you in the pulpit in order for the life to flow. He just needs you to, to, to be in concert with him. When you're in concert with him, you can't help yourself. You can't help but be sweet. You can't help but be nice. You can't help but be loving. You can't help but be patient. You can't help but to forgive. Why? Because it's your nature now. The life of God is flowing. It's flowing. Fellowship, can I serve notice on you this morning? The life of God is not over in this place. God wants it to flow. Therefore, God must measure. Hallelujah. He got to measure every single one of us. He got to take control of the whole man. He's not going to just measure your, your heart and, and your mind, but he's going to measure. He's trying to tell you that every single part of you serves a purpose. Your hands, your eyes, your lips, your feet. God wants it all to belong to him so that the Holy Spirit can flow in this place. Put this in my 
gentlemen, it's not over. Hallelujah. This is Pentecost. This is a new beginning. Hallelujah. This is Jubilee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we turn and look at everybody, hallelujah, with a, with a freshness. Look at somebody and tell them we're starting all over.